G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy Podcast. Today we have a great footy conversation between myself and Dan from the Pommy and Oz and Blue Abroad YouTube channels as well. If you're unfamiliar with him, Dan for at least five years has been making content, analyzing the AFL, contributing to the Blue Abroad channel as well. He's an absolute diehard Carlton fan and famously is English and does a wonderful job of analyzing our game. And there's content out there for everyone, not just Carlton fans. So in today's video, we have a really good yarn about how we discovered the great game of AFL how he came to becoming a content creator in this space, lots of Carlton chat, comparing it to what it's like to being a fan in England of English sports. And it's one of the best footy conversations I think I've had on the channel so far. So I really hope you enjoy the episode. Go check out Pommy's channel. I want to make more football conversations like this more regularly on the channel and be aware as well, the True Footy Podcast is available on your audio platforms, in particular Spotify. So if you could do us a favor, if you enjoy the podcast, I'd love for you to just give us a good rating on Spotify. That'd be great, only if you enjoy it. I want to make these quality football conversations a more regular regular thing that happens on True Footy. So for now, I just hope you enjoy the podcast. Cheers. G'day, everyone. Welcome back to the True Footy podcast. I am joined by my good friend, Dan, from the Pommy and Oz YouTube channel and, you know, plays a big part in the Blue Abroad channel as well. Dan, how are you, mates? It's weird that I'm interviewing you from Northern England and uh, you're in my native Australia. We've swapped, swapped spots at the moment. You're in Melbourne. How are you? I'm good, mate. I mean, you're working so hard. I was expecting an, an Aussie in Pomland channel to <laughs> pick out. Yeah, I don't know how much of an appetite there is for that, but uh, thankfully I've managed to uh, keep up talking about football from the UK. It's actually been much easier than I expected. But, uh, mate, I, I, I realised that um, there's a, probably a bunch of people who are well aware of who you are, but okay, I want to frame this podcast partially as um, maybe someone who hasn't discovered you yet. To start off, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, the work you do on YouTube? What's your channel about, Pommy and Oz? So Pommy and Oz is basically, it started as my way out of Terry's shadow. I was a little bit like Robin. So if you go through Robin's backstory, he's obviously, you know, got his own crew. And Pommy and Oz is that, do you know what I mean? It's like the Teen Titans. So, uh, yeah, what we do is we try and focus. We do focus heavily on Carlton because... It's hard to avoid the team that I love, but we do also focus heavily on the 17 sides. And I think we're we're pretty proud that we're very analytical. We use numbers. We try and not offer so much opinion, try and offer more factual-based opinion. And we try and be fair as well. It's probably the only place you'll see me where I'm complimentary of Collingwood and Essendon because I'm wary that you're watching me as a neutral or and I'm trying to be neutral. So... Yeah, we have a lot of fun and uh, we do all sorts of shows. We do a lot of collabs this year. So uh, your favourite YouTubers will cross my path. Yeah, absolutely. You've had me on the channel a couple of times. Uh, I've lagged behind. I've been talking about getting more guests on the podcast for about three years now. I think on the other side of the pandemic was when I first started doing it. That was when I met Terry four years ago. Uh, and I do remember your channel. Uh, you, you started probably like, was it 2020 or 2019? Forgive me. I mean, yeah, it was COVID. So COVID, COVID. We, we started churning out content. So I, I do think the channel started in 2013. It was my oh, own wow. personal channel, but I never yeah. posted anything. It was just literally so I could comment. And um, I didn't have the diligence to start a new one. I just changed the name of it. So there it is. But yeah, it was it was COVID was the big thing because uh, Terry went in another direction with Blue Abroad. If people remember at that time, he started churning out gaming content like terry was just desperate for content so yeah I, I went off on my own and i wanted to do daily videos and have a bit of fun and yeah i think it's important because i think you get typecast don't you i mean you're lucky jesse you've always been on your own but there's so many people out there do you know what i mean that we can talk about in the youtube era do you know what i mean you've got connor rogers you've got young king cookson you've got the boys from saint kilda tv like you kind of know the main guy and the other guys are there. It's it, I think it's important that you have your own personality as well. Absolutely. You bring that in spades, that's for sure. Um, so we'll just go back to when when you blew abroad, started as a, as a platform and you were – what was your relationship with Terry? How did that come to be where you started contributing on that? And for those who aren't aware, it's a, the I think the biggest Carlton fan platform out on – you know, independent anyway, um, you, you started, you know, contributing on there and then eventually started making your own content. But how did you discover Blue Abroad? How did that come to be? 
kind of because Terry was a little bit of the black sheep of the Carlton community. So when when I first started watching YouTube, there wasn't really anything on YouTube. It was all on Facebook because genuinely speaking, all the podcasts were old men and the loudest voices on Facebook were the older, older men. So Terry came on and it, his was just audio only. So I used to listen to that all the time. And I like hmm. the fact it was young and it, it was a bit of a different perspective because Terry was coming at it as he's never seen success. And obviously I've only supported Carlton since I got here pretty much a couple of years after. So that's like coming up to 12 years now. So obviously the best thing I'd seen was Judd knock out Richmond in the final. So 95 seemed fictitious to me. So it was great hearing Terry share what I believed as well, that it seemed a myth. And then just what I used to comment all the time, love Terry's stuff. And then just one day, 2019, he was busy. He was working with Port Adelaide in China. Mm -hmm. And he was like, do you fancy doing the preview? Because you're always commenting and talking. I I'd love you to jump on. And yeah, I mean, the video is still there somewhere. And it's really embarrassing because I I I've had a screen that's fallen down. I'm using a crappy <laughs> camera. I think I'm just in my underpants as well. There's a moment where I uncross my legs and you see that it's just a baggy jumper. All sorts <laughs> going down there, mate. Um, but yeah, and since then, I've become a regular. Yeah, it's, it's been great to see. I, uh, I actually was doing a little bit of research. Obviously, I've known who you are for ages, but any good podcast that does some research. And I found that old video of you guys in a coffee shop. Um, I think it's the coffee shop. It sounds like there's a coffee machine in the background where Terry's Terry's got this great series called Carlton People and he interviews big Carlton fans that, that was a I, I, that I'm surprised that video hasn't popped again since you've made you know your own platform in Pommy and Oz like because it was a really good chat and you talk about how an Englishman discovered footy um, you know I think you said your first ever game was Carlton versus Richmond the elimination final can you talk us through like how a northern Englishman comes to not only be a football fan that in itself is not super uncommon it's becoming more common but then also becomes, you know, a very prominent YouTuber in this space. Like, how did you, uh, what was your relationship with footy? How did you find it? Yeah, so when I first came here, I was close to being a Geelong fan. So my boss at the time at the golf club what, that I flew over on, he was a massive Geelong fan. I'm going to be a total caveat here. I hated football. It was ridiculous. It was men in pyjamas chasing an egg ball. It was half the sport proper football is to me. So, but... He, he he was pretty passionate about it. So, like, I, I'd tag along, I'd watch it with him, have some beers, and that he, he was trying to make me it. And then, obviously, I met my beautiful wife. Her, her, her father is a massive blue. So, like, it was probably the bonding over that. And mm. I'm one of these people that if I like something, I have to know everything. Like, I have to. I, I can't. It's a bad personality trait. It sounds really cool, but it's a really bad personality trait. My wife will attest it's a horrible trait I have. And <laughs> yeah, I fell in love. So like AFL 99 was my life. That was how I started to learn the rules because you Australians are like English people with the offside. When I ask a question, you give a really crap answer and just assume I understood what you said. Um, so AFL 99 actually taught me the rules. Wow. And I got more into it. And then I remember the commentators always saying, oh, he's had 12 disposals. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? And it just progressed and progressed and progressed. And in my game, football, I, I think that's my golf coaching background and being a golf professional, I love tactics. So football, tactics, why it works, how it works, how a team wins was huge. And I noticed in AFL, I could never find out about that. Like when I Googled stuff, I got nothing. Mainstream media had nothing. No one had any idea. It was just, oh, we kick the ball and score more goals than the opposition. So that was what I became fascinated about. And obviously, golf coaching at the time, a lot of footballers came through. Um, my wife always laughs that I've coached a few famous footballers. Um, I won't name the guy, but he was a very famous Sydney player that told me he played for Sydney. And I nearly burst into tears when I found out it was AFL. I was like, oh, I thought you meant proper football. <laughs> and and a few of the golf pros were very jealous I had this lesson so I broke his heart but wow. yeah I just became obsessed and then they I had a lot of golf coaches on my books they a lot of AFL coaches and AFL staff and they took me through 
why things work, how things work. And yeah, it was just a, a journey then into realizing that it, this was exciting. And I, I just love talking about it. Love talking about it. Wow, that's that's unreal. That was a way more in-depth answer than I was expecting. I didn't realize you coached, you know, people of that ilk. Um, did you say you were a golf professional? I was, yes. Um, wow. That was, yeah, my, my first job when I was like, well, my first job was McDonald's. My granddad made me work six months before I went off to university doing a proper job, he said. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was my, my job from 18. Got to see the world, worked in Asia, worked in India, um, worked a little bit in the Ukraine um, for a time as well. So traveled the what? world and that's what got me here. Um, literally, uh, it was the only place I hadn't visited and always wanted to come back here. And uh, yeah, never left. I was meant to be here for 12 months, um, but I, I met my wife and uh, I've never been back. Wow, that's incredible. I, I did not know that was your backstory uh, after having known you for years. Wow. Um, so you, yeah, you trapped, you said a Ukraine. Yeah. Wow. That's, ins that's insane. So is, is that part of your past now? You don't, are not a, into golf instructing and coaching now? I, I still have about 12 people that I still coach. Um, oh, okay. yeah. That's so awesome. that's like little pocket money tax man. If you're watching, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I still do it. Uh, I still play as well. I mean, it was a big thing once I had kids and stuff. It, it's a very tough job. Uh, and if anyone who knows me knows that I do things properly. So it was like 60, 70 hours of my life a week. So wow. it was a decision that I wanted a break and I went corporate and I've never gone back. But I did find my love again of the game. So very important that I think when it becomes your job, you forget how much you love the game. 100%. Yeah. I. Uh, where, where does football rank then? Like you've just to sort of describe three passions for sports there. One where you worked, you know, professionally in it. Um, where, where does football rank? Obviously, it's the, the newest of the three sports you discovered. Um, do you, is it surpassed soccer, as we'll, we'll call it on this podcast? Or where does it sit? It's tough. I, some days it could be number one. I'd say all in all, the because I get up at three in the morning to watch Manchester United, I, I still think, wow. I, I always say, I don't know if I was in at home, would I get up at three to watch football? I definitely watch the mm. game on repeat in the morning without checking the scores, but I'm not 100% convinced I'd do it. Wow. I, 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 so I'd say AFL is second, football is first, and golf would be third. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, wow, that's crazy. How do you have the capacity in your heart to love teams, multiple teams passionately? Like, I've got the Eagles. There is no more room. I Like, I'm a Liverpool fan. I'll check the score when it's on. Sometimes, you know, Liverpool played Man City and I kind of forgot about it <laughs> the other day because um, I just don't have any more room in me. Like, But Man United is probably your number one team still. Uh, love of teams, that would be harder. I think the game... Okay. Like, like uh, Carlton and Man United, it'd be hard. Like, someone asked me this question ages ago, would you rather win a flag with Carlton or the Premier League title again with United? And I said, without a second thought, Carlton the flag, if mm. you change the question to a Champions League... Uh, really? Uh, yeah, it'd be hard. So, But I, th I think one is m my birth. It's a, it's a team that all my memories with my pop and Man United... Mm -hmm my family, and then my new family is Carlton. So it's hard to separate. It's like choosing my favourite kid. Obviously, wow. I have a favourite, but it's hard mm. to say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly like that. That's funny. Um, sweet. So I remember when we did your uh, show a few weeks back on your channel, um, we kind of segued into like rule changes and stuff like that. So at the risk of going over old ground again, I want to know, like, as an Englishman who discovered footy, what were some of the more bizarre aspects of our sport? You know, we talked about how some things about AFL are just difficult to explain to people who don't follow it. You know, I think I think I said that about the fixture. It's like, yeah, we play each other once and and then they'll be like, oh, you don't play each other twice. And it's, oh, no, no, there's just arbitrarily five extra games that you play against <laughs> each other. And then there's a gather round where they're all on neutral venues. Like, eh, don't worry about it. So, um, yeah, what were your first impressions of the sport? 
I mean, at first, it, it's one of them games, isn't it, that I think, because I showed a few of my mates when I went back home this game, and like it was kind of funny to watch someone who's never watched it watch it and then say the same stupid things that I did. So, like, like one of the big things for me was the way that it looks like there is no rules, doesn't it? Like, to get the ball back to an untrained eye, it just looks like you guys can do anything. Like, you know, like, jump off the MCG and knee drop <laughs> someone, and that seems to be okay. I think that was the biggest rule of, like, how you tackle, that you can shepherd and you can shoulder to shoulder and knock someone unconscious, but... Tell you what, you trip them. Mm. Disgrace. You're a disgrace. You know what I mean? You, you might have broken the guy's jaw with your shepherd, but tripping him. It's disgusting. Exactly. I, I think it's a bit like football, though, isn't it? My, my football, that there is some intricate rules that do not make any sense. But then when you understand the game, it does make sense. So I think that was my first impression that it looked like it was literally 18 blokes versus 18. Anything goes as long as you don't kill someone. I'd kick the ball. And I think the one that always sticks out to me is that Australians are such a nice people, so kind, and want everyone to do well, that you give them a point for missing. <laughs> that, 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 you don't like that? Even now, I don't get it. Really? Well, uh, it's a good way to um, reduce draws. Imagine, like, because if it was just goals, I feel like we'd get a lot more draws. That's part 100%, of logic. But it just seems so counterproductive to me. Like, like in the UK, someone says, if you miss a goal, an easy goal, the fans will just sing something nasty about your mum. That's your reward. Like, over here, you get a point. It, it's weird. Yeah, that's true. I was just thinking while you're talking then as well, like, you know, the example where someone jump, jumps off the side of the MCG and, like, drops a knee into somebody's back. I was thinking, that probably is okay in the rules as long as you hold the mark. <laughs> Yeah, you, you see, this is the big thing as well. Like, one of my mates was watching the speckies. And yeah. he was like, that guy there's just need the guy in the back of the head. Is that a free? And I'm like, nah, he held it. I was like, if he yeah. missed it, though, it would be unrealistic attempts. And he's like, what? <laughs> like, 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 it's crazy. But, and like, but it was funny hearing English people watch it because, like, my impression, the first game I went to go and see, I think it was Geelong versus the Eagles, actually. Like, yeah, right. Being at the ground, my eyes were just telling me, yeah, they can do anything. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Legally, there is no rules. As long as you get the ball back, that's fine. Exactly, exactly. So I, I find it crazy that your first game was the Carlton Elimination Final. That was, if I'm not mistaken, was that the year Carlton was ninth, Essendon got booted out of yeah. the finals, they went up to eighth, they played Richmond and they beat Richmond. Am I right? Yeah, so you, you can actually argue that since then, Man United have gone downhill. And since mm. I came, United True. and Carlton have just never gone anywhere. <laughs> um, I guess just on that game, though, like, w did you have an appreciation at the time for what you were seeing when Carlton beat Richmond? Yeah, I, I was on another podcast the other day talking about, like, I, I think what attracted me to the game is, you, even though you know nothing about it, I think speaking to foreigners about, like, Ronaldo and Messi... They might not understand the game, but you can see superior quality. You, and I'm pretty sure anyone with functioning eyes can watch any sport. And the best, it's kind of obvious they're really good at it, whether it's squash, badminton, golf. It, it There's an aura. And I think Juddy, he had that aura, particularly that, that the game there. It was that aura that you knew you were witnessing something that is a little bit special that someone will talk about. 20, 30, 40 years in the future. Um, Gary Ablett Jr. is another player who had that uncanny ability, even when he played for Gold Coast. You watched him and you just knew he was superior to everyone else. Like he, he was on a different plane to everyone else. And obviously, as a West Coast fan, you'll know Judd, he was on another plane, wasn't he? But he did play yeah. with some good players, Ben Kerr, Benny Cousins. Do you know what I mean? We, we can't yeah. forget them. But yeah, exactly. You can see it, can't you? For sure, for sure. Um, what was what's it been like as a Carlton fan through that period? Because as you said, you I, I remember you saying in the uh, video with Terry, you like you haven't seen anything good. Um, obviously, they they won a final that year, but I think twenty fourteen was that the first Malthouse year. It was, My, yeah. It was, yeah. Time. So how how did that? Um, how how was your relationship with them 
you know, that, that was probably, the, I think you said the first year you started to get really into it. How has that uh, impacted your passion, I suppose, um, following a rebuilding team? Well, I think it's something that I always say to Australians when the, I've got a lot of mates who see my passion for football and they say, look, I need a team in the UK. Who should I support? And I always say to them, don't pick the team that's winning because mm. because it, it, it ruins, I think it ruins the experience. I think there's something beautiful about being a Man United fan that I'm an old man. I've seen highs, I've seen lows, I've seen okays, and then I've seen perfection. So I have a good appreciation of the journey. I think that with foot, what Carlton has taught me is I always look at it from my soccer background. So Malthouse particularly, I know in the UK, a manager that's done it before does not guarantee success in the future because, because it's structure, it's personnel. There is so many variables. Just because it's worked before doesn't mean it's going to keep on working. And I also have an appreciation that English game adapts, I would say, massively every two years, where AFL... I think I've only ever seen three massive changes in my time that's been here. And I think this year is the first time I could identify 12 styles of football as opposed to the champions and the guys copying the champions and slightly tweaking it. So mm. I, I think the appreciation I had there was how how stupidly passionate Carlton fans are. Like mm. Carlton fans are probably the most blind faith fan base in the AFL. Like I we were talking funny, me and Terry, after the preseason. I remember beating Hawthorne 2018, leaving that game in the preseason, going, God, we look rubbish. But people going, Oh, Cowan are good. We're going to, we might make the f finals. We might be in an AA and winning two games. So I, I do think the wonderful thing that being a football connoisseur helps is you have the appreciation of that because history is one thing. But I also think the journey is huge. And um, it, it's something that I think that's a big thing for me. Like, it's been a horrible time. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you that 12 years of supporting this team has been a joy. There's, there's been times that I have sat at home going, I chose these idiots. <laughs> like, some people are born into this. I chose this. Like, what an idiot. And <laughs> but I wouldn't have it any other way because, I mean... There's something magical, isn't there, about... Like, you've experienced it, Jesse. You've experienced the highs and the lows. There is something oh, magical. Lows? I don't know what you're talking about. about. <laughs> West Coast and lows? Nah, nah. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't ring a bell with me, man. <laughs> um, no, you make, it, you make a great point. I do think that's a great thing about our sport. And, um, you know, I've said in other videos, I think my love for West Coast really intensified when the whole club fell to its knees a little bit before your time in terms of footy watching but um you know uh, when cousin judd left 08 to 10 we were pretty horrific and that was literally when i became a super fan rather than just being a fan and it's the the building concept and and being able to you know take plays in the draft and be able to foresee the future is it that doesn't really exist in english sports um certainly not the premier league which i follow I'm, i must say like i can't I think my roommate's in the next room. He might hear this and he's a Man City fan, but I can't imagine anything more soulless than supporting Man City. Someone described like winning a title with Man City is like losing your virginity to a prostitute. It's like, <laughs> you can't brag about it. <laughs> oh, it's like, like, fair play, it still counts, but like, don't brag. <laughs> What an analogy. What? <laughs> that threw me, that, Jesse. No, mate, <laughs> mate I'm with you because, like, you know, one of my best mates in the UK, Nick, he he's a City fan, and we always used to fall out as kids. United City, I'm yeah. an old man. Liverpool aren't our rivals. Man City are our big rivals. That it's that They try and take my City over. But I, I look at it, and I, I look at it with City, and I'm like, I've seen him watch Tranmere away in front of 700 people losing in League Two. I, I know I know he's seen rock bottom. The thing that scares me is I walk through Melbourne and I see thousands of Man City shirts. And I remember when that club was 12 hours away from liquidation and not existing. Mm -hmm. And wow. I'm thinking, where were you then? So mm -hmm. I agree. I think it might be weird if you're taking them on now because... For me, the, the beauty of being a Man City fan would be I went through all of that. Wow, look how good life is now. Like, this is my reward. And that's kind of how I look at Carlton at the moment. I, one day, we can look back that I reviewed 
uh, a game we lost by 18 players with GWS by 100 points at the G in 2018 when GWS couldn't even field an interchange bench from third quarter time. So then you can watch me review the grand final. Like I had been at low, I'm now at high. I agree with you. I find it hard, and this isn't a criticism because obviously being foreign watching English sport, you ain't going to have the love and you ain't going to have the heritage. and It's going to be hard to develop that. But yeah, I don't understand how you can look yourself in the face and be a Man City fan. <laughs> if, unless your dad was and he's told you about how bad it was or unless you were watching them on a virus-infested stream 10 years ago when they were irrelevant. Like, mm. I don't know how you can enjoy it because winning's good, but something beautiful about winning when you've been on the journey, when you've been there. And I think that's what makes sport great. Like, it's going to happen. It's inevitable Carlton win a flag. It's inevitable Man United come back to the top. But I kind of enjoy United being rubbish at the moment like because it, it humbles me. It humbles me. And I said it on a podcast the other week. Mm. My advice to anyone who's a Collingwood fan is don't waste your time at the moment bagging other clubs and taking the piss. Enjoy it. Because if I could go back to when United won the Champions League, I, I wish I enjoyed it more. I wish I didn't take it for granted. I wish mm. I'd lived every minute, read every book, watched every everything about it. Because I didn't. I kind of, I remember watching it. I was an adult at the time, getting drunk with my mates, singing the songs. We couldn't get tickets. We got ripped off by a tout at the time. I remember it, but we were there in the area, Moscow on a night out, great night out. But wow. I wish I enjoyed it more. Like, because I didn't enjoy it enough. I kind of, okay, we've won a Champions League. We'll do it again next year. And I didn't probably appreciate it. And that's what I've learned as a Carlton fan now. I appreciate every win, every loss, because you never know when it will change, good or bad. A hundred percent. I resonate with absolutely everything you said there. I think um, I think my personal experience of being a footy fan has been kind of perfect. I mean, things got pretty bad last year, but you know, I, I started following the Eagles when we were right bang in the middle of the table. We got incrementally better. We won in 06, and therefore I still had an appreciation for moving up the ladder, but I'd never seen us be really rubbish. So then I got massively humbled, you know, 08 to 10, um, and then experienced little disappointments on the way, all the way back to 2018. And then I was like, oh, and so as a result, 2018 meant so much more to me. But I have often wondered, like, if I hypothetically supported, you know, a West Coast team that won four out of five premierships, which is not going to happen. And I'm sure I would enjoy it, but I really don't know if premierships two, three, and four would carry the same weight. And I would actually wonder what it would do to my relationship if I supported a club that's successful. But I suppose you just have to ask Hawthorne fans. They still love their football, so maybe I'm just talking shit. <laughs> I, you, you know, I've seen it with Manchester and I've seen it with Carlton. I, I think if you look at our older fan base, when you're incredibly successful and you have a dynasty, some of them find it hard to accept they're not that team. So... When I first came mm. into social media, I felt like there was a large portion of Carlton fans who just believed it was a birthright to be good mm. and couldn't understand that maybe you're not good anymore. And I see it now as a Man United fan. We were blessed with winning everything. And sometimes you do take it for granted because it happens every year. Like you're always there and your brain starts to say, this is life now. But it's funny. I see a lot of people my age and a bit older going, 90s United wouldn't lose to these. 90s United would batter these. 90s United yeah. don't lose. And it's like, it's not the 90s. It's not the mm -hmm. 90s. It's 2024. We're an absolute basket case of a football club. And you've got to accept where you are to get better. You've got to hold your hands up and go, that's not going to happen. And I do think AFL is so historical and so new in its, its age, really, that some people do struggle to realise it is a different game. Like mm -hmm. 1980s Carlton, if it played under today's rules with today's players, would get battered by mm. the side because of the way the game has developed. They'd still be very good footballers, but the way it is, it's different. And Jesse, we do ladders. How hard does ladders get now? Because I would say there's 14 sides who could be in the eight. And yeah. two years ago, there was 10. Mm. Max. Yeah, 100%. And then you've got to pick teams to drop as well. 
because the, the unpredictability of the league as well. A lot of predictions have become my least favorite piece of content by far. <laughs> I didn't get I, too much hate this year though, a little bit, but like I'm I had to really make a bold call though, like lock this in, doggies bottom four. Yeah. Well, I famously tipped Colling for the spoon in 2022 when they were one point off a grand final, but I definitely wasn't the only one, thankfully. Thankfully. And my bowl call, it's, it's actually funny as a little side note. The most criticism I got was not having West Coast last. Like that was my Eagles bias. It's like, you can see my own like predictions over the years if you tracked it. The Eagles are just slipping, slipping. And each year I do still tend to overrate them when I acknowledge that. But it's like I can put them 17th and people are like, this is bullshit. <laughs> What, That's how, wasn't it you last year on Riley's video where it was like tip with your heart, yes. tip with your head? Yes, it was me. <laughs> I, I, and and people were potting you for using your heart and having them too high. I don't remember their comments on that, to be fair. Maybe I'll go back and have a look. In my defense, in my defense, and it looks silly now, but I predicated my entire logic on Nick Nat being available for, for, uh, for the full season, Elliot Yo not having soft tissue injuries, let alone the historic injuries. Eighth was still going to be way too high, but I think I tipped with my head and I put West Coast 12th. And I still don't think that's horrific if you have the All-Australian Ruckman back in your team, if you have Elliot Yo. But, um, but to be fair, you put yourself out there. You got you got to accept the criticism, so it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. it was one of my favorite when people were backing you for it because I was just like, "But it's his heart. He's a wet. He's an Eagles fan. Like, mm. like it, it's not meant to be an intelligent comment. It's meant to be what <laughs> the king of wishful thinking thinks." One hundred percent. Can't bag him for loving his club. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Anyway, the the, the threshold is now. 17th too high so <laughs> we'll see i'm quietly confident but we'll see um as we we're talking then i was thinking another unique experience perhaps for a footy fan particularly in melbourne particularly in a final right is like if you go to say a big united game or whatever in the uk it's almost entirely going to be united fans if it's a home game so i've actually been to old Trafford and i saw united liverpool and to illustrate this point when liverpool scored i wasn't even sure what had happened because there was it was dead silent. Like there was no atmosphere. You could hear a pin drop, but you could just hear faint whistling and you look down and you could see like a couple of Liverpool fans <laughs> down there. But you know, maybe a big final in Melbourne would be different. You know, Carlton Richmond, the the those games are, are unique in the sense that you have um, you know, a split crowd. And I've been to a grand final where West Coast has been playing and when West Coast would kick a goal I'd be like, shit, there's a lot of people here supporting West Coast. And then Collingwood kicked a goal. And I was like, oh, no, never mind. They're still massively outnumbered. But either way, there was trading cheers for each team. Um, and that seems to be like a uniquely Melbourne thing, I reckon. Like in South Australia, Western Australia, when there's a derby, there's a home crowd and, and then there's a small contingent going for the other team. But in Melbourne, it seems like you might have a bit more of a split crowd. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't help that. AFL has like only six grounds and yes, four grounds are shared by what 12, 14 teams. So it, it's weird. I mean, that is probably the biggest aspect I find bizarre because I, I think game day experience, if you're comparing to football in the UK, football in the UK wins by, by, by a long way, by a long way. And like I always say, I, I saw some decibel readings from Carlton versus Melbourne and Carlton versus Richmond in 2013. And if you actually go on the inside, this isn't me making it up, but League One Sunderland's average decibels is louder than that with <laughs> half the fan base, with half the fan base. So wow. NHS did a big research on is it causing death, deafness and hearing loss in young people? And they actually found it was unsafe there. And I know Sunderland fans are mental, are mental, but it is different. It's a different vibe. Going to the UK recently and watching my mate coaches – in the conference, like there's a different atmosphere because we're segregated, even at lower level. It's like, if you step over here, you're not safe. And it creates that atmosphere straight away that it's you versus them. My first game sitting next to a Richmond fan, knew, knowing I'm a Carlton fan, I was actually a bit reluctant to talk to him because I thought mm. I was in the wrong seat. And then him saying, Oh no, sit yourself down. Why do you support Carlton? And, you're, you're foreign. Weird, because like in the UK, if that was Manchester-Liverpool and you sat next to a Liverpool mental fan, 
even though you were obviously Australian, they ain't going to forgive you. Mm. You're the enemy. I dressed yeah. neutrally when yeah. I went. <laughs> yeah, it's totally different. And like, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I think culturally, if you're Australian living here long enough, yes, to you, that's really bad. To me, that is the lower class of the United Kingdom. We're very proud of where we are. You know, I remember growing up in one of the roughest council states in the north of England and being told it's a shithole, but it's our shithole. And that is the mentality. Like, you know it's mm. bad, but this is yours, man. Like, mm. no one can take it away from you. That burning car, that's our burning car. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so I, I think the British people are very tribal, which might surprise them, but we're very proud. We're very tribal. We're very possessive of what we have. So I think, yeah, it's a different vibe, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's a family-friendly atmosphere, the AFL. Like, even if you look at the banter online, like, so, as an Englishman, I see some of the things people complain about in the comments, and I'm like, that would be considered a good day in the UK. Yes. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I remember someone called me a chummy, chubby, pommy idiot, and the chat getting really angry about it, and I'm like, my mates call me shit like that. <laughs> like, like like, I'd buy you a beer for calling me that. Like, yeah. it's a different vibe. It is a different vibe. That's very true. That's very true. Yeah, when I went to Old Trafford, admittedly, like, Man United Liverpool is one of the biggest fixtures in the world, right? Um, but I remember I got there a little bit uh, late because they closed my gate because there was some protest on. I'm still filthy about that. It was the only gate to the stadium closed, and I walked in, like, 10 minutes into the game. But there was something weirdly electric about the atmosphere. It, I'd never experienced anything so tribal. And I would 100% compare it to a grand final and, and in some ways more intense because the 90 minutes there's chanting, whereas in, you know, in a grand final when there's a stoppage, you know, it's still, you know, there's a bit of a buzz, but it's not like 90 minutes of rampaging fans. But I was trying to find my seat and I felt it was like irrationally intimidated by the crowd roaring and just chanting the whole time. And I was like sweating trying to find my seat. And I was like, why am I sweating? Nobody's looking at me. But such was the atmosphere. And I think maybe even the acoustics of Old Trafford. Um, have you been to Old Trafford? I have, I guess, yes, yeah. many a time, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the atmosphere was just unreal, man. Um, again, like I said, it, it is the biggest game. So that that's my only point of reference for a Premier League game, but just absolutely unreal. And I, I actually felt weirdly glad that Liverpool lost because then I got to see the home crowd going nuts and that in itself was a wild experience uh had Liverpool won it would have been dead you know I wouldn't I wouldn't have walked away being like wow that was amazing you know um but yeah thankfully uh I think the game after that we beat you 7-0 so yeah it, it, yeah less said about that the better let's be honest <laughs> no I've got a Liverpool section here in the notes Pommy um <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. So let's talk a little bit about Carlton for all the, the talk about, you know, Carlton not having the best time since you've been a fan. This, we talked to you right now and, uh, it seems like a great time to be a fan. What are your feelings of, um, where Carlton's at at the moment? We're recording this actually the day before Carlton take on Richmond. I reckon I'll have this up by then, um, by the time the game starts. So we're one week removed from the amazing comeback at the Gabba. What's it like to be a Carlton fan right now? I think it's really good. I think the positivity from Carlton is really good. And I think when you look at the great sides in any sport, there's always an identity. Like you've mentioned, like United, we talked about English football, like United have an identity. Liverpool have an identity. There's a certain expectation and brand of football they play. And I feel like Carlton, since the salary cap scandal, uh, we cheated. If you're not a Carlton fan in the comments, you're going to say, so I'll use the C word. I, yeah, I feel like we've been lost. I feel like Carlton have been lost in some kind of horrible transient plane of trying to be liked again, trying to be loyal to what we are, and then trying to be new Carlton. And I think the wonderful thing about Carlton is this year particularly, just one game, is that real ownership of what we are, which is we ain't a sexy football side. You look at the 2018 Eagles, ball retention, great kicking side – that just wore you down with skill level. Then you look at the Richmond's dynasty in between that fast-paced, real chaos football. Then you look at the Hawthorne era before that, get the ball back quickly, cheat and get behinds. We added a new rule because we cheat so much. 
And then you look at Collingwood's. Collingwood's brand of never give up. That The cockroach of football, Collingwood, over two years. Even if you take the head off them, they still manage to find a way to eat and poo. It's amazing. So That's a Cal- great analogy, actually. That's a great <laughs> reference. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't have and used Cal- those exact now, words. We've but... realised we're not a good kick inside. We can't play quick ball movement. We haven't got the players. But what we have got is we've got heart. We can pressure you. We're fit. And it's we're, we're, we're ugly, aren't we? We are, you know, like to use the Ian Holloway phrase, like we went out wanting a supermodel and we've gone home with a six out of ten, but it's done the job. We're happy. We've got married. I mean, we've had beautiful kids. Our life is better for it. So Carlton are, you know, Carlton play a brand of football like my wife. Do you know what I mean? She's perfect for me. She's my 10. <laughs> I dug I myself like out of a right hole that I started building. I was going to say, where's of... this going? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Carlton from afar has been, you know, clearly a roller coaster. I don't think there's any other word for it. Um, I think I made a video in my Carlton prediction, sorry, in my latter prediction 2022, I'm pretty sure I really emphasised the possibility that Carlton had this potential premiership winning spine. Like I don't make a lot of good calls, but I made the pretty good call about Carlton. And I was just like, no, I see it. You know, we doing um, Mackay, Kerno, Walsh, et cetera, uh, Cripps. And I, I foresaw, I was like, this could be the start of something big. Five rounds in, that's looking pretty good. I think they're undefeated, four wins and a draw, only to go through a 10 or nine game slump. I can't remember exactly the details, but I then made a video about round 15, talking about the finals race. And I named... I can't remember how many teams, but Carlton was not one of the teams that I thought was in the finals race, only for them to get five goals up in a prelim. How was it being a Carlton fan during that period? Did you lose the faith? And and what do you think really triggered that second half revival? I think if you're like, if you've grown up in sport, I think like coming from a small community back in the UK, some of the first times I learned about anything was through sport. And this is why I'm a big advocate when people say politics doesn't belong in sport. I'm like, for some people, that's their only education. So, like, for me, when I was a young player, young young boy, the first time I'd ever heard of racism, racism seemed imaginary to me because I didn't really know anyone who wasn't white in my community. Mm. Everyone was white. And then the concept of not liking someone for the colour of their sin seemed balmy. I was like, that, that seems ridiculous. Mm. But then seeing players that you love and you fall in love with break down in tears you, you learn through that. So you're like, okay, this does exist. Okay, all the other manner of things, sexism, things like that. For me, I learned them through football, homophobia. I learned that through football and how that affects people from players and big prominent fans coming out and saying how it makes them feel. I think we count and I had a big personal change around 12 because I am known for being one of the more irrational people. I'm going to put my hands up. And I think Carlton... When I saw them come off against Essendon, that game, seeing them being spat on, seeing all the half awful things that they were being told, said, you know, something changed in me. And I was like, right, okay, you need to start being who you really are. And I know a lot of my mates tell me, you watching the football and some of the things you say at the time isn't you. And I think that's how we learn through our mates. I learned a lot from Carlton where I was like, well, you know what? It can't get any worse, isn't it? Maybe if I start giving them a bit of love, giving them a bit of affection, treating them like my kids and how I treat them when they mess up, maybe it helps. And yeah, I started getting really into the positivity of it and trying to be problematic instead of angry. So, okay, this is the problem. Let's be the analytical one. A real good mate of mine back in the UK, we worked together with top players in golf, said to me, when thick shit hit the fan back in the UK, you have this great way of just looking at it and saying, okay, cool, we've got to fix it. So we can cry about it or fix it. And I was like, right, let's bring that into it. So I felt a personal development through my football club of like, right, they've got no one. The fans hate them. The press hate them. Jesus, even the police now are arresting our chairman for tax evasion. It's really bad. Everything's going wrong. I can't stick the dagger in. So... I love this Stronger Together movement. I wish we'd done it before. And I was like, let's get behind them, man. And I remember that Gold Coast game really well, doing the watch along. First quarter, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. I mean, it was so bad. I think Levi Casbolt could have become Tony Lockett. It was that bad. It was that bad. 
But I remember quarter time giving the chat a pep talk saying, let's just sing. Sing our songs because we chant on the watch alongs. We have chants. It's very English. And I was like, we're going to get them through it. And then something turned in their brain. It, it it started to turn. Everything started to work. We look different. And before you know it, we're in a prelim. Do you know what I mean? Like, and it just, for me, I always think you've got to take lessons out of things your eyes see. I think humans are flawed and we look at the things we haven't got, not what we do have. And that taught me there a great inspiration that, can you imagine being Jacob Wheatering, walking off, someone spitting at you and then throwing mm -hmm. a Guernsey down? And then telling him, 12 weeks' time, mate, you're going to be playing in Carlton's first prelim since... Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, it mm. literally was the first prelim they've played. Last time they did it, the Queen was alive. You can actually say that now. Yeah. I mean, I mean like, that, that's another error. Do you know what I mean? We're now in the Charles times, not the Elizabethan times. Like, that's True. How and it just shows you that it can turn around. Things can turn around. With a bit of belief and a bit of system. So, yeah, man, like, it was great. Like, honestly, there was a point in time where I started to feel like we were immortal. Like, mm. for, from round 13, being depressed and thinking, shit, anything could happen against Gold Coast. Like, we just come off the back of Essendon. To so suddenly, big lights, Melbourne in the first final. It was wow, man. Like, I, I couldn't believe it. And... I always say this, if you stopped me in the Essendon game and said, you'll be in a prelim this year, I would have probably punched you. Yeah. Like, but it just shows you, do you know what I mean? And it, it's a great story. And I might be putting words in people's mouths. I'm sure all 17 other fan bases can't argue with me. The AFL needs a good Carlton. We need a good mm -hmm. Collingwood and we need a good Richmond and a good Essendon because – whether you love it or hate us, we are a massive part of the AFL. Like, you need them four clubs doing well. Mm. That was such a good answer. And I, I love that. And, um, you know, I think there's, it, it, it's funny observing all kinds of fans, actually. Well, regardless of sport, I think this is true. Like, often fans are the first to pot their own club and, you know, chuck their toys out of the pram when things are bad, but the second an outsider criticizes, they go fully on defensive and like, oh, how many premierships has Fremantle won, bro? Um, <laughs> just as an example. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's an interesting like psychology of fans, but you know, I think as someone who's just started an Eagles channel at rock bottom, right, uh, for the club, like it's, it's interesting trying to choose like the cadence and the tone of my videos and my predictions and, exactly what sort of fan I want to come across as. And I wouldn't say that I have a responsibility but I, in terms of how I hold myself, but I also think there's a lot of value in being a relatively positive sort of platform in this space, especially like you and you're the same, like you do Carlton watch-alongs and stuff like that. And I think there's a lot to be said for wanting to be the sort of fan who when things go right again, I can proudly stick my hand up and say I supported them the whole time rather than being one of those fans that just pots the club and it, it's full of hate and, you know, sack CMO or sack the coach or whatever, only for us to come good and then be like, oh, this is great. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I think there's something to be said for supporting the club through the lows as well. It doesn't mean you can't criticise. I've been pretty critical on the Eagles. You know, I think, I think I've given very fair criticism, but I think I just stopped short of hating. Whereas I don't know if every fan gets that right. I feel like this. I don't know if you feel like this in the Carlton community. Do you feel like there's fans that um, just watch along and just and seem to wait for things to go wrong and then give their opinion? And then when the good times come, they go away. That, that, that type of person is so interesting to me. I think that's society. I, I think mm -hmm. our life is built around negativity. Our life, mm -hmm. negativity sells. Do you know what I mean? Like you look at anyone who's successful, particularly Australia, I feel like Australia has the biggest tall poppy syndrome in anywhere I've lived. And I've lived in some beautiful places, like coming from the north of England, we want our brothers and sisters to succeed. And we, we look at it. I remember when I became a professional golfer, where I come from, you've got three careers. You either work at McCain's, the chip shop, right? Two, you become a thief. Three, you become a drug dealer. Like, I went secret option number four. And like a lot of my mates and when I went back home, they, they kind of like idolize you in a way because you've done it 
and mm. it inspires them a little bit to know this isn't where we live. And I think it's really interesting that you what you said there, there is some Carlton fans, and I mean this with love, I think just genuinely want us to be shit. And mm. I, I think I, I think everything in life is an addiction. So I do actually think you can be so bad for so long, you become addicted to it because we're creatures of habit. So if you're always rubbish at something, negativity is a drug. You see it with your kids. You ignore them for four days. They'll smash a window because attention is good attention. You you give them positive attention through good medium. Watch their behavior change. Kids are simple creatures, really, when you have them. I think humans are as well. And that was one thing, Jesse. I'd love to hear your take on this. This is really hard. So I'm, a, I'm really into my religion growing up Romani. So we worship the ancient way. I found when I did YouTube, there was kind of a drug to sometimes be negative. And I didn't realize it was happening. And a good friend of mine pulled me to the side and started showing me the things I was saying over a year's period. And then was like, you're so weird because on the Monday show, you're calm and you're collected and you're trying to fix the problems. But 12 hours ago, you were wanting to burn the place down. Rebellion. And it's the heat of the moment. And mm. it, it made me realize that's not who I am. I am a passionate person, but I genuinely am one of them people that goes into the car, screams, says a load of swear words in a dark room, and then I come out and it's out of my head. I, I started to realize that I think you've nailed it starting a new channel. Be the person you want to be. Fuck other people. And I am 38 wise. I'm an old owl. Even I fell into the trap at times of sometimes pandering to your audience, pandering to what is easy. I think Arsenal Fan TV, Mark Goldbridge, they do a wonderful job, but they do know the way to get a new Renault Espas is, say, sack Ten Hag, burn Old Trafford down, because everyone wants to see it. But in reality, it's probably not who they are as people, and I think they're a bit smarter than they make out. So mm. I think that's probably my advice to people in sport. Be the person you want to be, and... I always use this analogy. If you're at work and someone's calling you effing incompetent, is that going to help you? Probably not. Because you know when you shit. Like, as a golfer, I don't need someone to tell me that's shit. I know. I need someone to tell me, want your best work, make the next one better. That's what I need in that mm. moment. So I've tried to make a big focus in the last 12 months of being more really me, really trying to, be self-aware. And it's actually taught me a lot in my life because speaking to my wife and my kids, sometimes I, I can be an emotional wreck and be irrational in the heat of the moment. So it's really made me aware because I can watch myself on TV, which not many people can. Mm. No, I love that. I, uh, you know, I got to say, I think there's a lot of value in letting yourself cool off straight after an Eagles or Carlton game before turning on the camera. Because before YouTube, like I had a couple of well, I, I was renowned for being a real sulky fan, at least around my house. Nobody knew who I was then. Um, but, like, you know, I, I'm a sulky Eagles fan, or at least I used to be. And uh, you know, I used to post on Big Footy a lot. And I've had a couple of, like, absolute howlers over the years. But this, we're talking, like, right after the game when the emotions are still high. And I think back in 2017, I think Jetta played a game where we lost to GWS by 10 points. And I wrote um, – if people are from Big Footy are watching this, it would be funny. But I wrote something along the lines of, like, I know Jetta was best on ground, but let's just cut him. Like, what's the point? <laughs> because I was thinking we're about to go through a rebuild, right? Anyway, it becomes an incredibly important part in the grand final when he signed 12 months later. That didn't age well. I remember in 2018, I didn't post this anywhere, but I remember thinking we beat Geelong in round three. We were two and one. We'd just beaten the Holy Trinity, Gary Ablett, um, God, Selwood and Dangerfield. And I, I was still sulky that we nearly lost. And I posted something along the lines of, I think we're going to win this boom. <laughs> it's like, it was 2018. It, it, it's um, tough. It is tough. And, uh, like, yeah. you know, as I've got older, you fall into traps, man. You, like, honestly, like, I, I am the most spiritual person. And I'm all about energies and taking it on. The, social media, especially this platform, it isn't for the faint hearted. And, mm. My advice to young people who are in my DMs about starting it, be who you want to be. Just remember that. And like sometimes other people's energies affect you. Like, like I read the mm. I read the comments in the lives. And sometimes 
it drives the hate inside me. And it's something that I've been really conscious. And I know it's easy to say we're three games into the season. I have been really good, though. I've been really good. I've, I've been my excitable self, like you like to see. I've just tried to, when I feel the negativity, just ask myself, is this how I really feel? Or am I just a little bit pissed off he's Mr. Set Shot? Do you know what I mean? And, 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 and I've started to be, it's, it's a trigger in my life now, like everywhere, a little bit of a trigger. Do I really need to get angry about this, Dan? Or do I just maybe need to suck it up a little bit? Like, you know, put my big boy pants on. And it's, it's dangerous though, isn't it, Jesse? Because sometimes you can be driven astray without even meaning to be. Hmm. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, the root, the reason I brought that up apart from just embarrassing myself is, is just that there's a huge difference between like how I am immediately after the game. And if you give me 24 hours, I'm, I'm fine. And I think also being a content creator, having every opinion I have on football in the public arena, that's open to be criticized. Uh, it does change the way I think, but I think for the better where I, I self regulate my ideas a lot better. And I do think that particularly if you're talking about um, your team and where I used to upload all my Eagles videos to True Footy Nats on a different platform now, but I think the internet needs a steady hand or at least a cool head to analyze games or at least, you know, like for a certain team, right? I, like anyone can rant on camera. Anyone can, and, and some people want to see that. They, they click for the rant. They want to see the emotional explosion or whatever. But for me, like, especially when my team has lost a bad game or something like that, what do I want to see? Well, after the, I've called off a little bit, I'd, I'd rather see like a really calm analytical post about how bad the game was, but in a in a very measured way. I think there is, there's got to be an appetite for that. And that's what I'm going to strive to be with um, True Eagle. Now, I'm hoping that they don't give me any opportunities to rant like that. Like last year when we lost to Sydney, you know, I was raking in views with the Eagles because we had a record-breaking loss after a record-breaking loss. Um, but I'm hopeful that I won't have to do that again this year. But I kind of do wish I, uh, you know, I kind of wish in 2018, like I'd just started True Footy, I documented that season more. Um, so I'm kind of, obviously Carlton haven't done it yet, but I'm kind of envious that you guys are now going through this period where this, well, 2022 is a great season, 2023 could be. You could document that. Is that something you think about? It is. I, I remember watching Kirden do the watch along for his grand final, right? And it's a great bit of content. The one thing that stood out is I just felt like he didn't get into it enough. Like, but then again, like I'm a very hard person to watch sport with. Even my mates in the UK say that there is something actually psychologically wrong with me when I watch sport. And I admit that there is. I I, I live it. I I for that time it's on it's mm. me versus the world with my boys and mm. do you know i mean i'll go against anyone who doesn't want to help my team win um but yeah it's something that i think that we are going to see the journey because i think for a fan like me it's 10 years just over so you've got to say i'm 38 but in real real terms i'm like 14 years old and it's hard to look back because there's no evidence so when someone from 95 tells me, oh, the streets were blue and the beer was pouring, what I'm looking forward to is when Carlton go through their next rebuild, I, I can say, look, here's Uncle Pom, here's your dad, here's your granddad. I I've been there. This is what it was like. This is what it was like. And, yeah, I, I know the grand final watch-along will be the most watched piece of Carlton content ever. And... I feel very honoured to have that in the palm of my hands. Would you do a watch along? Would you not try and go to the game? 100%. Yeah, I you try be... if failing that. You no, go I, I, I'll be doing a watch along 2,000% oh. because it's so important to me that I'm a big believer of energy and I'm a big believer of channeling. I think that's my place. I enjoy that. I prefer watching the football so I can analyse it in the comfort of my chair and the fan base we've built on the back of that. I know what it's like to be a mile away from home, not being able to go and see your game and then being able to watch it with a mate. And trust me, I have no Man United mates in Australia. There isn't any that love the game like me. So I enjoy watching the watch alongs. Makes me feel like I've got a mate again and seeing someone else get angry and sad and cheer. It just makes you feel like you're back. So mm. I, I love that place. And that, that's one reason I'm thankful for COVID. We had that opportunity 
where everyone was stuck at home. And we've got a mental crew on the watch along. Like, honestly, I would say the support we have on the watch along is better than the support of the ground. Wow. Like the noise that they make, you can feel the energy, you can feel people enjoy it. And it's great. And there's some mental people have approached me in the street and they listen to me at the game, which I find even wow. more bizarre. Wow. That like, is more bizarre. bizarre. I never thought about that. Like more bizarre. Like one of my mates, he, he said he was sat next to a lady and he said that she had that earpiece in. And he was like, every so often it got really loud. And he was like, sounds like fucking Dan. And he looked over and she said, she was watching you. He was like, wow. you were like 10 seconds behind and she was watching you with the earpiece wow. on. And he was like, I know him. He's my real life mate. And she was all <laughs> excited. And I was like, that's insane, man. Like, that's insane. That is actually fascinating. Well done. Well done. That reminds me of like my grandma. She would, um, she would always have 6PR in her, phone, in her ear, just listening to games constantly. And now there's a new age of people listening to YouTubers. That's crazy. I don't know why that's blown my mind so much, but well done. <laughs> it's a weird thing you don't have in this country. You don't have like a biased commentary. So in the UK, that has been mm. something that since I've grown up, we have local radio stations. So mm. they have <laughs> like more of a biased take. So if there's a 50, 50 call, the other player dived, like you could break a leg. Like I remember listening to right up North when I used to live in Whitby, Yorkshire coast radio, a player would have to die for the commentator to say it was a foul. Like, mm. like, do you know what I mean? Like, you could kick someone in the face and they'd be like, oh, that defender, his face got in the way of the striker's boot. <laughs> like, it was... And, and that's the commentary you want to hear. Like, you mm. don't want to hear, oh, that was bad by us. You want to hear, like, the world is against you. So I do think there's a market for that because I listen to SEN and things like that. I, I can't stand Australian commentary. Like, no disrespect to Australians. This isn't bagging you. But I would say I would rather listen to it in a language I don't understand because it doesn't sound good. Mm. I don't think you'd have too many Australians argue that point with you. I think, yeah. And and the commentators get distracted so much. Like they start talking oh, yeah. about pizza and what pie have you had at halftime. Like when I watch someone talk about sport, I want to be educated. I want to know why that works. I want to know why that. The only reason I have you on is to aid my experience. And I think when you watch the Premier League, they're fa fantastic at doing it. I, I think when you listen to the English commentary, they're fantastic at educating you from a rookie to kind of know what you're on about. Well, I feel Absolutely. like Australians, it's it's not there. And like BT, trying so hard to be funny. Like you can tell BT isn't funny he is. He has rewrote. Or I guarantee he writes his jokes before it happens, and he hopes this happens so he can say it. Where to me, I, I feel like it's more organic. Like Shane Warne was probably the last Australian commentator, rest in peace, who I thought was just naturally good, mm. and I could listen to him talk about cricket all day because he he had the moments of stupidity, but then he had his moments of educating you why this was working. Well, yeah, AFL commentators, I don't get it at all. And how come there's never any analysis as well? Like the game finishes, they're telling me about sports bet. Mm. Like, yeah, it's true. True. it's true. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, like I said, I don't think you'd have too many AFL fans who would staunchly defend AFL commentary. One kind of theory that I have, you know, I always used to put it down to just natural biases and and I do think that exists. Like, and I don't just mean against West Coast. I mean, like I've seen Fremantle games where, well, I, I think back to one where they nearly beat Geelong, like 2017 at GMHBA, and the commentary was just about how brave Geelong were, and Fremantle were rubbish at the time. It, it was ridiculous. But what I also kind of think is I feel like they flow and get excited with the crowd rather than necessarily picking a team. Like Hudson's pretty bad for it, I noticed, and I don't have anything against him specifically. But, you know, like I remember the Eagles um, and the Bulldogs last year, the Eagles obviously like shocked them with one of the biggest upsets all year. But he just kept forgetting to get excited when the Eagles were kicking goals because the crowd wasn't. And then, you know, wait when he'd kick a goal and he'd lose his shit. That, that's just a microcosm of like something I've noticed league wide. I don't think, I don't think it's super professional, um, but there's like a lack of competition up until now. So they kind of keep getting away with it. I think, I, I think the AFL is very clever 
of how they hide stats and they hide mm. behind copyright. Like we, we get copyright struck for, I mean, you could get copyright struck last year for saying Gil McLaughlin. <laughs> are they like, it's an absolute joke. And, and the AFL want to build the game. And it, it, you look at the product and you think like, if I was a football fan in the UK, I want to know how many sprints this player has boom you found it there was an app i was shown in the uk my mate uses to find players and it like automatically downloads all the full games and chops them up and it works out at like 20 pound a month to have that function and then if you were a creator you could actually press a button and it removes the copyright and you actually own that and i'm like how does that not exist here like no one cares about this game north of blooming melbourne like, how hard is it? Like, how hard is it? And it, it does annoy me. I feel like they've made it satire. They've made it poor. It seems fabricated. The great commentators don't get enough time. Like, Daisy Pierce, I know she's a female, and I know that's really scary talking about a man's game. I know a few of us are still being dragged into 21st century. But listen to her. She explains what's going on. Like, I used to like listening to Daisy because she'd explain it and say, well, this is what they're trying to achieve out of it. And this is why a player gets coached this way. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then I've got BT trying to say Arazio Fantasia, just making names up. I'm like, what What has he added? Like, And my granddad used to say about the internet, when I explained it to him, he was an old war hero, but he used to say the internet looks very scary to me because all it seems to be is a place for the village idiot now to have a microphone. And he wasn't far wrong. Like, he wasn't <laughs> far wrong. So, yeah, it, 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 it's a good job things like we exist and we try we try and give the media, that's what I try and do, try and give the media I want, mm. what I want to listen to, I want to have a bit of fun, but I also want us to just take a breath and talk about the good and the bad fairly. Absolutely, mate. I think uh, there's definitely going to be a place for that in an age where, Everything is so media and uh, sorry, everything is so clicks and engagement driven. Like everyone in WA is complaining about the West Australian. That has been the case for like 10 years. And yet we keep going back. And why do we keep going back? It's just that they know how to game our attention. They've also got pretty good access to things like training reports. Like they send someone down to Eagles and Dockers open trainings. They give us the blow down. So we're going to keep clicking and we're going to keep falling into the same trap. But I think, um, I think the rise of the independent creator as as allowed them to maybe find a position of being able to sift through the bullshit a little bit and to some extent you know even people who work in on youtube or any other platform they'll still have to drive engagement they'll still have to get clicks and stuff like that but if you can find a balance between creating enough intrigue to get a click on a video or whatever but making sure the content has integrity then i think that is the sweet spot and hopefully that is the new generation of independent media i guess May I mean, I mean, I think there's a place for stupidity and I think there's a place for ridiculousness. We like it. The world is too serious. But I do think, I agree with you. Like, you talk about WA, Lockie Schultz signs for, for Collingwood and the Victoria media almost make out like he's an alien. But if you watch the game, Lockie Schultz is brilliant. Like, he's mm. devastating. Like, if that was a Victorian player, we'd all be going, oh, wow, yeah, Lockie Schultz. He's, he's, he's like Charlie Cameron, do you know what I mean? But he's got a German surname. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, th- we get excited, but it, there is a mass, like, I understand there is a big bias. Like, people talk about it, and, and people get offended by it, but I'm like, it's kind of true, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like, like, I know I'm not, I'm not really Victorian, I'm English. So I, I feel like even though I'm Victorian, I, I can comment. There is a massive, and we know, don't we, Jesse, we, we've done this for too long. Pre-season, you know things are going to happen. You know Essendon have won the pre-season flag. Like, because it's an easy article, isn't it? You know someone's going to say, oh, my God, Nick Cox did a lap. Flag, They're going to win the flag. You know that there's going to be some off-season turmoil at a club no one cares about. I'm looking at Melbourne, Bulldogs, North Melbourne. Someone no one cares about. There's been a criminal activity. Like, I remember a couple of years ago, do you remember the West Cut, the, the Bulldog story that bikies had turned up? Like, mm. always happens. Uh, and you also know they're going to either say, 
Carlton are going to win the flag or they're going to bottom out. Like, it's actually boring and monotonous that they have these articles pre-written. Like, they have them pre-written and mm. they get sent out random times like, oh, I can't be bothered. Carlton win a flag. Let's send that one. <laughs> 100% mate absolutely um look this there's been a great chat I could talk to you for hours I feel like we even did half an hour before the start of the pod but we have ticked over an hour now so I feel like we should wrap it up but uh let us know in the comments if you want Pommy and I was back on the channel on the True Footy podcast I'm probably gonna do it anyway um but uh thank you so much for your time Dan uh before you go do you want to um let us all know or remind us where we can find you well type in Pommy and Oz on anywhere and i'll pop up instagram twitter we occasionally dabble in facebook but facebook's a bit of a scary place nowadays um but we've even started tiktok because my wife is obsessed with tiktok and so are the kids so you will see me there there is some stupid bets going around so i have promised if Carlton win a flag we will do a live concert of taylor swift dressed as taylor swift with me singing and dancing so stay tuned for that um if you ever want me not to cheer Carlton in the grand final, make them bets. Um, yeah, but we pride ourselves on engagement. Come and have a chat. Tell me I'm an idiot or tell me you love me. You'll get the same response. I enjoy talking. So um, come and see me. Perfect, mate. I'll leave all the details in the description anyway. I'll probably tag you in the title, so I'll make it nice and easy. But uh, yeah, thanks again for your time, mate. And good luck against the Tigers tonight. God blows.